Hello everyone, welcome. This is episode one with Mark Solms. Mark Solms is a leading neuroscientist, um, a pioneer um, in neuroscience and has spearheaded neuropsychoanalysis, which is a discipline which involves the welding of neuroscience and psychoanalysis. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Um, Mark has written many papers. Some of the ones I found really useful, I'm gonna um, introduce or include in the references. Mark's also, as you can see, um, actually you'll see it in a moment, but it's uh, called The Hidden Spring. It's a book Mark wrote on um, essentially tenets of um, neuropsychoanalysis, but also he goes a lot into uh, consciousness, how he can explain consciousness through a dual aspect monist perspective um, in which sort of information processing underpins what we call material and mental. Um, so, yeah. I hope you enjoy the podcast and yeah if you do enjoy listening to Mark I urge you to or urge you to go and listen to his other stuff on different podcasts because he, there's quite a bit out there on um, that Mark's done and yeah thanks Mark uh, for doing this um, I don't know if you will listen to this probably not because you're a very busy person but I'd just like to say yeah thanks Mark and uh, yeah I hope you enjoy the podcast. So it's great to have an opportunity to kind of clarify some stuff. Um, and I just, yeah, I was hoping, I suppose, for the first half to just go through uh, the kind of neuropsychoanalytic stuff. And then uh, the second half to talk about consciousness um, and sort of dual aspect monism, um, you know, the sort of your, uh, how you sort of articulated consciousness in your book. And then some critiques that I kind of have. And then a couple which I found uh, from other people and just wanted to hopefully explore that so yeah I, i'm you're a neuropsychologist which i suppose is uh, the study of the brain and uh, was it the 90s you started to train as a psychoanalysis or late 80s late 80s and that was because i'm uh, correct me if i'm wrong but you, you i think you said it in a podcast with, is it michael egnor maybe um and as well in your book the, there was a despondency within you maybe or a sort of uh, a thirst for more because in neuroscience you know it's it it really deals with a map but the the territory of the psyche wasn't there is is that part of what what made you want to become a psychoanalyst very much so yes i wanted to study the mind and there wasn't much mind in neuropsychology yeah which is quite fascinating really isn't it <laughs> yeah and i remember you saying in, in the in the podcast i think uh, you had questions and you went to a supervisor maybe with questions that regarded the mind and you were swiftly told not to ask such questions. Um, so I think it's, yeah, it's fantastic that, you know, you've managed to smuggle in the psyche into uh, neuroscience. <laughs> uh, it's about time someone did. Um, and yeah, so I suppose I, I have some questions actually around um because I'm an assistant psychologist, and so I have some in, some quite I'm quite curious to talk about uh, actually psychoanalysis and its application. But before that, um, it would be good to, uh, I suppose, uh, discuss what what dreams really. I, I I was hoping to explore neuropsychoanalysis, you know, uh, so the, the the welding of the two disciplines through uh, dreams and memory uh, consolidation reconsolidation and the, and the systems of memory because at least in my understanding that seems to be two of the main kind of uh ways in which you can integrate uh the different um you know um disciplines so yeah i mean what do dreams tell us about the psyche according to psychoanalysis and then how has neuroscience neurobiology supported and furthered our understanding um of the psyche yeah with in itself and regards to psychoanalysis so um i suppose the main reason why uh, freud was interested in dreams uh, was because it is a kind of model for insanity uh, when we dream we are hallucinating and we are delusional um, but it happens to all of us and it happens every night and we get over it so we can reflect back upon uh, what uh, state of mind we were in uh, while we were as it were psychotic which is not um, 
what you can readily do with most people who are psychotic in the pathological sense of the word. So that was the starting point. Many people, uh, like, for example, the English neurologist uh, John Hewlings Jackson, expressed similar views that if you can understand uh, dreams, you will understand insanity, as, as Jackson called it. Um, Freud's fundamental uh, proposition uh, regarding dreams was that only part of the mind goes to sleep at night. Uh, that's the part that he calls the ego. In other words, the part that's in touch with external reality. But the part that he calls the id, in other words, the part that's in touch with the um, internal drives uh, of the uh, living organism, that part can't, by virtue of what its job is, it can't go to sleep. So the balance of power, as it were, between the um, constraining, uh, the constraints of reality represented by the ego um, and the demands uh, of, the, of the endogenous drives uh, represented by the id, the balance of power between those two forces shifts in favor of the latter. And so this gives us, um, according to Freud, this gives us uh, privileged access to the contents of the id. In other words, what the basic motivational um, workings are uh, of the of the dreamer. Um, that's the essential idea. Uh, that I could unpack that in a little more detail. Uh, perhaps I should add this detail at least, that Freud thought that because motor action is blocked uh, during sleep, um, and these motivations, these rather primal motivations are released from inhibition, uh, there's a risk uh, of them gaining control, uh, you know, of, 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 this, of reaching for action, which would be incompatible with sleep. So in order to protect sleep, says Freud, we dream. In other words, the dream is an hallucinatory enactment, an, an enactment in virtual reality, uh, uh, an imagined reality uh, of what it is that these drives are impelling us to do, uh, these disinhibited drives. So according to Freud, uh, dreams are, they serve a sleep protecting function rather than wake up uh, with these disinhibited impulses. Uh, we imagine ourselves, we hallucinate ourselves uh, fulfilling them. And Freud said, uh, this involves a process called regression, which is a backward, rather than moving forwards towards action, uh, these motivational impulses move backwards onto perception. Uh, and so uh, there's a regression onto the perceptual systems, as he, as he put it. Um, all of this, importantly, remember, is in the service of protecting sleep. Uh, it's an attempt to fulfill these wishes in an imaginary way so as to protect sleep. Now, again, as I said a moment ago, there's a lot more I, I could say, but that's sort of the nub of it. Um, and therefore, what people dream uh, reveal something um, in a in a rather um, in a rather more frank way about what it is that's uh, on their minds, what it is that they want, um, uh, what their deepest uh, heartfelt desires are, um, more more than than waking cognition does. So that was that was the whole hoo ha about uh, about dreams uh, for Freud. Now. Yes. When you ask about what neuroscience has to say about this, so when we started um, from the 1950s, when we discovered REM sleep um, and its uh, extremely high correlation with dreaming, um, and uh, thereby had the opportunity of uh, identifying the brain mechanisms of dreaming uh, by by virtue of um, the fact that REM sleep is an objective physiological state, you can tinker with the brain and see, well, which parts of the brain uh, are, are generating this state. Uh, there were various landmarks along the way, but it culminated in the work of um, Alan Hobson, uh, who by the mid 1970s um, had identified pretty much uh, uh, all of the important moving parts of what's going on uh, in the brain during REM sleep. 
And uh, the news wasn't good for Broek uh, because what he found was that there's a small group of cells in the pontine brainstem, in other words, in a very ancient uh, and in Hobson's view, mindless part of the brain, uh, responsible for reflexes and the like, um, that these cells, which, um, which are the source cells for a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, that they automatically switch on roughly every 90 minutes during sleep, uh, while some other cells, which I don't need to mention, switch off, uh, and then they swap around again. The other ones switch on, and the the, the um, cholinergic ones, these ones that generate uh, the REM states, they switch off. So he said, look, it's clockwork. It's pre-programmed. It's clearly not motivated. Uh, there's, there's nothing dynamic about it in the sense of psychodynamics. There's nothing emotional or motivational about it. In fact, he used the phrase motivationally neutral. Um, and um, the, 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 the neurotransmitter acetylcholine has no special uh, wishful properties or uh, it has nothing to do with desire uh, or, or the kinds of things that Freud thought um, uh, drive the dream process. And um, they activate the cortex randomly. Uh, there's no, there's no um, meaning to the pattern of activation it's just noise this is hobson speaking yes and, yes um, yes yeah you know, he says that that noise uh, just like an ink blot uh, which is also noise it's just a random splotch of ink on a page um, you can look at it and find meaning in it you can say that reminds me of my mother you know but uh, it doesn't actually in itself have anything to do with your mother it's just you projecting meaning onto it it's like reading tea leaves um, and so this was hobson's view um, once we'd found that REM sleep is generated by this mindless part of the brain, like clockwork, and it just activates the, the organ of the mind, the cortex, it just activates it randomly and creates this kind of chaotic, it's intrinsically meaningless uh, imagery. Um, that it's, he says that the, the, the psychoanalysts then find meaning in it ex post facto, but it's not actually, the dream itself is not motivated, it's not meaningful. Uh, it's not even a psychological um, function. It's just purely physiological noise. So that was the view that I was um, taught. Uh, we were all taught that when I trained in the in the 1980s in, in neuropsychology, that was the standard view. Um, uh, and uh, I did some research starting in the mid 80s, ending in the mid 90s, uh, which showed that all of that was wrong. Um, and I must tell you that it was just good luck. I, I didn't have some brilliant idea uh, that I was going to prove <laughs> Hobson wrong. I was just trying to work out some details about what goes on in the cortex during dreaming by asking human beings. Most of the work had been done on rats and cats, but mostly rats who have in common the fact that they don't speak. So, you know, you can't ask them about their dreams, uh, but we didn't need to, according to Hobson's ilk, because... We know dreaming is just the subjective experience of this objective phenomenon called REM sleep. They're the same thing looked at from two different points of view. So we can drop the dream side of things and just study the objective mechanisms. Um, so I was interested in what human beings report um, about their dream experiences when different parts of the brain are damaged. And so I did a large study in several hundred patients. That's why it took so long to do. And um, what I found was just completely um, surprising, to say the least. Um, the, first of all, most importantly, uh, human beings with damage to that part of the brain stem that I mentioned earlier in the ponds where those cholinergic cells are that drive REM sleep, when that part of the brain is damaged, they report preservation of dreaming. They still dream. So that was a shocker. Uh, and I went back over the literature, because you must remember, this was the 80s and 90s, a good 30 or 40 years since REM sleep had been discovered and its association with dreaming established. And I found that not one single case had been reported uh, in a, of a human being uh, in whom uh, damage to that part of the brain leading to a loss of REM sleep, which it does, uh, not one case had been reported where the patient uh, is, uh, said that they no longer dreamt. 
it, it, it seemed either nobody had ever bothered to ask or it was too embarrassing to report you know, that, uh, in fact, we still dream even without REM sleep. So um, that was the first finding. The, the other one was that there are other parts of the brain uh, which, when damaged, do lead to a loss of dreaming. But in those patients, REM sleep is preserved. So that's what we call a double dissociation in neuropsychology. Uh, if damage to area A leads to loss of function A, but preservation of function B, and damage to area B leads to loss of function B, but preservation of function A, that means function A and function B are two different things. They are doubly dissociable. So REM sleep and dreaming are two different things. They happen to occur at the same time. That's a correlation, uh, but they, they are not the same thing. Um, so I then uh, looked into um, what the part of the brain, which when damaged, uh, what this part of the brain is doing, because clearly that's the crucial driver of dreams, not, not REM sleep. Um, and in fact, there are two parts uh, uh, of the brain which, when damaged, uh, you get a loss of dreaming. Uh, the one of them is not so interesting, which is the posterior, the perceptual, the sort of uh, uh, heteromodal, sort of like where the different mod perceptual modalities uh, combine uh, in the in the in the inferior parietal lobe. Um, it's it's, it's sort of necessary for generating mental imagery. Imaginary um, scenarios can't be generated if you don't have the the the, the sort of um, uh, the wherewithal to do so. So that's not surprising. If you can't generate uh, visuospatial imagery, um, then how are you going to generate a dream? Um, much more interesting was the fact that uh, the second area that leads uh, reliably to a loss of dreaming uh, is a, a, a fiber pathway um, in the, connecting the brainstem uh, with the frontal lobes, roughly speaking. Um, and that uh, my, my focus then became on you know, what's going on here. I was able to narrow it down to one particular uh, pathway, which is which is technically called the mesocortical mesolimbic dopamine system. And I emphasize the word dopamine because please note that's a different neurotransmitter from acetylcholine. So acetylcholine drives REM sleep, dopamine drives dreams. It was possible to show that by a variety of methods, um, lesion methods, uh, positron emission tomography, uh, single cell recordings, microdialysis, um, all of it pointed uh, and uh, and pharmacological manipulations, uh, all of it pointed to the fact that dreaming is driven by by dopamine. Now, what's interesting about that is that is certainly not a motivationally neutral uh, brain system. It is it is the um, if there were any um, brain uh, system that you would equate with what Freud had called this libidinal drive, which he speculated lies behind dreaming, uh, if any part of the brain performs the same function as this hypothetical drive of Freud's, uh, it's the mesocortical mesolimbic dopamine system. It is, um, Kent Berridge calls it the wanting system. Uh, most neuroscientists call it the brain reward system. Um, Panksepp calls it the seeking system. It's, a, it's an all-purpose um, desire system. You know, it's, it's what makes us get up and go. It's what makes us uh, interested and engage uh, with the world. Um, it's, the, it's the most basic positive motivational system uh, that, there, that there is in the mammal brain. So it's really quite astonishing, you know, that this system uh, lights up like a Christmas tree uh, when we're dreaming. Uh, and this lends a new uh, and surprising uh, support uh, to the Freudian uh, theory, which is most unlikely. I mean, when you look at your own dreams, it doesn't seem as if they're giving expression to your base wishes, you know, but uh, this is what Freud said, if you like what lies behind the the, the declarative content, the, the non-declarative, the implicit content of dreams, he said, is of that kind. So, you know, it looked like it, perhaps he was onto something after all, because it, it, is, it is most counterintuitive 
that while you're asleep, you know, this uh, brain reward system that, that normally drives your most uh, passionate interest in doing stuff in the world um, that is found to be pleasurable and rewarding, um, that, it is, that it is so active. Um, and then there are just two other things to tell you that, that I found. Uh, the one is that the, uh, remember I said at the beginning uh, that Freud said it's the ego that goes to sleep, uh, the id uh, does not. Um, well, the part of the brain that you would most uh, plausibly equate with Freud's ego, in other words, the part that's in charge of its sort of realistic um, uh, planning and, and uh, uh, engaging with the world in a kind of rational, logical way, uh, that is the prefrontal cortex. Uh, and so what I found is that patients with damage to the prefrontal cortex, although they lose ego functions galore, I mean, they really are severely cognitively disabled in terms of planning their lives and, you know, and, and thinking their way through things and solving life's problems. They are severely impaired and emotionally disinhibited. Um, Despite that, uh, their dreams are the same as yours and mine. You can't distinguish between them. Blind raters, when presented with the dreams of frontal lobe patients and, and normal controls, they can't distinguish the dreams. Subsequently, a colleague of mine uh, named Alan Brown, uh, using PET imaging, showed that, uh, that uh, the prefrontal cortex is indeed, uh, it goes to sleep, where sleep onset is, is, is um, amongst other things, uh, uh, characterized by a dramatic deactivation of prefrontal cortex. And uh, that when we uh, go into REM sleep, which let us not forget, correlates very highly with dreaming, uh, it doesn't come back to life. Uh, the prefrontal cortex stays deactivated, but the posterior cortex, the perceptual systems, including the part that I just mentioned, which is if it's damaged, you can't dream, uh, the, the parietal cortex, and that that area lights up, so it sort of reawakens. That sounds very much like Freud's regression uh, to me. In other words, we see this motivational drive, uh, and uh, then we see uh, no activation of the of the motor systems of the executive control systems, but instead we see activation of the perceptual systems. So. Um, that leads to the very last thing I want to tell you about dreams, which is a study I'm doing now. I finished the pilot study. Uh, we're, now fin we're now completing um, the, the, the main study, but the pilot findings are so dramatic uh, that I can report them to you, um, you know, with confidence. Uh, patients with damage to the parietal cortex who cannot dream, uh, remember they have, that, they have that drive from the mesocortical uh, mesolimbic dopamine system, according to the Freudian hypothesis, that would wake you up if it weren't for the fact that you have this hallucination this, uh, on the perceptual systems, this hallucinatory experience. So that led me to the hypothesis that patients uh, who no longer dream, uh, but nevertheless have this, uh, this uh, dopaminergic drive during sleep, that that should wake them up. Uh, if Freud was right, so that's a direct test. It's a it's a falsifiable prediction arising from the Freudian theory, and that's what we've done this pilot study on, and it's confirmed. You know, patients uh, uh, with 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 posterior cortical damage who can't dream, um, a lay person uh, would say, well, they should sleep better because their sleep is no longer disturbed by dreams. Uh, the the counterintuitive hypothesis of the Freudian. Uh, would be that, in fact, no, their sleep should be worse. And their sleep is dramatically worse. I mean, their sleep is bloody awful. Uh, oh, see, no. Oh, you dear. see shocking uh, insomnias uh, in, in these patients. So, you know, the the stories come full circle. Yeah. Uh, I, I've summarized the Freudian theory. I've told you uh, what the neuroscientific critique of that theory was. And uh, then I've told you that, well, subsequently we discovered that that critique was based on a misconception, namely that REM sleep and dreaming are the same thing, and they're not. And when you when you uh, actually elucidate the brain mechanisms of dreaming uh, as opposed to REM sleep, you find a remarkable concordance uh, between the dreaming brain uh, and the dreaming mind as uh, construed by Freud. Yeah, I mean, um, wow, uh, very, very 
um, amazingly put. Uh, I mean, I had questions um, sort of following on from that initial one, but you, you've, all, you've answered them really. Um, and it brought up a few things. I mean, just then you mentioned the falsifiability thing. It's, it's very interesting because I think it was Karl Popper who famously said that psychoanalysis isn't falsifiable. And it's, yeah, you know, I suppose when you break it down, it uh, is. And maybe Karl wasn't um, familiar with neuroscience or recognized what it could do. The other thing, um, I suppose, so essentially, yeah, what neuroscience has um, demonstrated from what you've just said is, you know, uh, that the um dopaminergic um sort of meso uh cortico mesolimbic uh system we could call the id right yeah, yeah it's and, certainly a core a core part of it yeah uh, uh, sure 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 mm. um and that the ego which other work you know for example um i think damasio did work on it and then obviously got like phineas gage but basically that we can it, what aside from dreams we've been able to map the ego onto the frontal cortex and that then the frontal cortex, um, yeah, is uh, sort of less active um, during um, dreams. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it all just makes so much sense. Um, and particularly as well, you know, when you think of the fact that we are predictive organisms, um, which I think is evident. And I think, you know, this is uh, dreams are just a... Um, speak of this and it's it, i've got so many things going through my mind and questions you know and thinking of like psychopathology and um i suppose we'll come we can always maybe i'll ask a question on that in a bit the other part was then um so with psycho yeah so memory consolidation and memory reconsolidation um and particularly with regards to psychoanalytic treatment so how does the psychoanalytic method in terms of, you know, when you're in the, um, the therapy room session and doing the work, how does it, how does psychoanalysis work um, according to, um, I suppose you could say, yeah, memory consolidation, reconsolidation, um, and I suppose uh, where possible using um, neuroscientific um, findings. Well, let me start with um, that word prediction, predictive processing. Um, the, the basic idea um, is that we don't just passively um, experience the world coming at us. Uh, we're actively predicting uh, what we expect is going to happen. And we um, adjust our actions accordingly. In other words, uh, I'm doing this rather than that because past experience teaches me that this works and that doesn't. In other words, I meet my needs if I do that, and I, I do not meet my needs if I do the other thing, so I do this. Uh, so when I act on the world, I predict that certain um, consequences will follow. Um, that's the basic idea behind predictive processing. It, it, and if, the, if what I predicted uh, does indeed follow, then I carry on acting, uh, you know, on the same basis as before. Uh, but if what I predicted does not follow, uh, that's called prediction error. And uh, then I have to update my predictive model. Um, and in other words, I learn from experience and I change my mind. Um, and that's the essence of the whole sort of predictive processing uh, story. Sure. Um, so the, the, that, that maps in a very straightforward way onto basic assumptions in psychoanalysis, uh, which um, goes something like this, you know, that we, on the basis of our past experience, we avoid certain things and we are attracted to other things. Um, that's what Freud called the pleasure principle. In other words, we want to do things which feel good, that, that is to say, meet our needs, uh, and we want to avoid things which feel bad, that is to say, thwart our needs. Uh, and so we act accordingly and we on the basis of learning from experience uh, we form predictions what Freud calls wishes so basically the same thing uh, you know what what we're trying to achieve what we're trying to bring about um, and uh, as long as it works then great uh, and if it doesn't work it feels bad because now our needs are no longer being met and uh, we use this uh, these these unwanted developments uh, 
diction errors in the parlance of, uh, of contemporary you know, theoretical uh, neuroscience to update our predictive models. Um, the, 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 the additional part uh, that Freud adds is that this is an unwelcome development. We resist, um, we resist uh, finding that we were wrong. We, we, uh, by the way, the same applies to scientists. You know, you uh, you make a prediction and it doesn't pan out that way, <laughs> way you expected. Uh, it's not exactly welcome news. You know, it means your theory is wrong. In other words, your predictive model, you, the way you thought the world works, is not the way the world works, and you've got to adjust your assumptions accordingly. The same thing happens with all of us in everyday life. That uh, this is what. Uh, so, so uh, in in Freudian terms, you know, we have the id, these drives, these emotional needs. Uh, that we are seeking to meet in the world. And then you have the ego, which learns from experience, um, a, a predictive model of the world. Uh, and we uh, uh, gradually um, update this model. So the laying down of predictions uh, is, to use the words you used earlier, uh, is called consolidation. Uh, and the, 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 the finding that the prediction is, um, is erroneous uh, requires the prediction to be um, to be um, uh, 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 to return to a state of uncertainty. You no longer can predict what's going to happen because what you thought was going to happen didn't happen. So now you're in a state of uncertainty again, and then you have to lay down a new revised prediction. That's called reconsolidation. Yes. So so you consolidate a prediction on the basis of. Uh, a, 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 a working memory, you know, interaction with the world, trying to solve the problem. Here's my solution. I consolidate it. Uh, whoops, uh, things haven't turned out as expected. I have to rethink that prediction and reconsolidate it. That's, and we know a hell of a lot about what goes on in the brain uh, when uh, we are consolidating and reconsolidating um, uh, uh, memories, which are predictions. Let me just make that clear. Memories are about the past, but they are for the future. You know, the, mm. the, the whole purpose of learning from past experience is to better predict the future, better predict what to do in future on the basis of what works and what doesn't work. <laughs> so in psychoanalysis, uh, clinically, um, to, to, to translate all of what I've just said theoretically into what the practicalities of what actually goes on, um, is that... The, the, the analyst is trying to get a sense of what the patient's predictive model is. Uh, and that's based on recurring you know, patterns of how they go about meeting their emotional needs. Uh, there's all sorts of technicalities, but basically it's it's called transference, you know, the, the repetition of uh, the unwitting repetition. The patient is not aware of what their underlying predictions are, um, but they they enact them. Uh, and so in, uh, the, the, the psychoanalyst makes the patient aware, uh, you know, can you see that this is how you're going about meeting this need? And that's fine in the case of predictions which are viable, which are realistic. Um, but uh, if you are using predictions which are unrealistic, which aren't actually um, fitting the bill, aren't uh, hitting the mark, uh, then this is going to lead to prediction error, uh, which which uh, causes uh, things to go wrong in life uh, because you're not fitting in with the way the world really works. You know, you're banging your head against the same wall over and over again. But remember what I said about resistance. We don't like to recognize that we're wrong. Um, but uh, the, the task of psychoanalysis is to help the patient see, you know, unwelcome facts. Um, I mean, you could say it all boils down to just that. It's a set of techniques about how we help people to face the facts especially those facts that they would rather not acknowledge. So yeah. prediction errors um, is the, the, the bringing to the patient's awareness uh, of prediction errors to give them an opportunity to, um, to find better predictions. In other words, better ways of meeting their emotional needs. That's sort of the nub of what, of what psychoanalysis is all about. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And um, what you're saying there, and you use the word, um, I'm, um, in your book a lot I'm not sure if it's necessarily when you're using the word it's with regards to psychoanalysis and it might be more in the context of consciousness and just um, free energy but uh, the fact I think psychoanalysis though is this word it's homeostatic it's a homeostatic almost um, 
approach in a way, isn't it? It's trying to enable the agent, the organism to um, essentially, uh, I don't know how you articulate it, find better homeostasis or return to some form of uh, homeostatic functioning. Better ways of doing so, yes. So all uh, living organisms, us included, uh, are uh, we, we are fundamentally uh, uh, regulated by homeostasis, which is basically just to say that there are certain viable parameters within which we have to remain, like core body temperature and and uh, uh, blood pressure and and uh, oxygenation and hydration and you know and so on. If you if you move out of your viable bounds, you know you're, you're at risk of copying it. So you have to stay within uh, certain preferred ranges uh, in regard to a great many different parameters. And if you move out of those um, preferred ranges, in other words, you move out of homeostasis, uh, then there's a demand to do something. Um, and uh, the, the, the doing of something is the work of this prediction that I was talking about. So you have to have a prediction about what must I do that will bring me back into homeostasis. Uh, the, the doing things in the outside world is called allostasis. What do I do in the outside world in order to bring myself back into homeostasis? Right. And right, yeah. uh, so the, the learning uh, that I was talking about earlier, learning from experience, um, has, has uh, uh, everything to do with um, learning how to get back into homeostasis, so how to remain in homeostasis. In other words, basically, uh, how to survive. Uh, the, the, the mechanism is as, is, as, is as fundamental as that, the mechanism of homeostasis. So uh, the drive that I was talking about earlier is the deviation from the homeostatic set point. So the greater the deviation, the greater the drive demand for predictive work. Um, and it's felt as an unpleasant feeling uh, that's of a particular kind. I'm thirsty, I'm sleepy, I'm in pain, um, I'm too hot. Uh, I'm sh I'm short of oxygen, you know, etc. These different types of unpleasant feeling uh, are the drives upon uh, the the ego drive. The it drives, I mean, upon the ego to perform predictive work, to learn from experience and from taking account of reality, to yep. build a predictive model about how to get back to where I need to be. When you're heading in the right direction, it feels pleasurable. When you're heading in the wrong direction, it feels unpleasurable. So that's the the, the 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 really basic basic mechanism. Sure. Um, uh, of, go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, and it spills quite nicely into um, this word you've used to use there, which is affect. And um, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the uh, I can't remember where I read it. If it was one of your papers or if it was in the book, but um, that one of your disagreements with Freud is that feelings or affect cannot be unconscious um, or is there more to it than is that too simply put no um it's 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 more there's more to it than that um the for freud uh, there's the drive is not conscious the drive is an unconscious process um and it culminates in us feeling an affect um uh, to, to th th that's the difference between me and Freud. I, I, I don't believe the drive is unconscious. I believe that the what's the point of a drive if you don't feel it? You know, the it, like, like for example, you're constantly um, burning up sugars uh, which are deposited in the fatty tissues of your body, um, and you don't feel that as any kind of drive. It's not a demand made on the mind for work. Um, so I don't think that's a drive. I think it's just the need. It's uh, the word that we should use for that is we need sugar. And so we burn up our body uh, sugar supplies and that's fine. But then eventually they run out and then you then you have to do something. That's the demand. You now mm. have to do something in the outside world. Mm. And um, that is felt as hunger. And that is what motivates our voluntary behavior. Um, so, so I think it just makes much more sense to speak of the felt uh, urge, the, the felt need um, as the drive, rather than to speak of the, uh, the, the unfelt need. In other words, the, 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 the needs that are met automatically, um, they, don't, 
they don't make any demand on the mind for work. Uh, they, they just function automatically. Uh, it's those, uh, it's when those automatic uh, mechanisms, autonomic, to use the physiological term for it, autonomic or vegetative functions are not mental. Um, the, it's precisely when uh, you when they reach their limits uh, that you have to perform mental work, uh, allostatic work, as I called it earlier, where you have to uh, find a solution because your inbuilt reflexes uh, and instincts don't uh, cut it. Uh, now you have to actually come up with uh, 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 some solution of your own. That is the work of the ego, which is, by the way, ego, of course, is just Latin. Uh, for for me, you know, for I. So the individualized part of the of the mind, the ego, is the part that has uh, that has uh, found its own way in the world that it finds itself in, over and above uh, its inbuilt phenotypic reflexes and instincts. Um, so it's the it's, uh, it, it's the, the drive upon the mind to perform work is the id making demands upon the ego to learn how to solve this problem because there's no uh, there's no uh, god-given inbuilt um phenotypic solution you have to find your own yes so that's that's it and and when that and when the id is doing that when there is when drive um you know the body is making demands upon the mind so to speak are you saying that you think it's better appropriate to conceptualize it as that it's always conscious yes that, that it's felt that it's felt it has to be felt yeah so look uh, i've so far i've oversimplified it when i've said to you uh, that we have inbuilt reflexes uh, like for i used the example of burning up uh, fatty tissue uh, the, the glucose in, in adipose tissues I, I could use another example if you're too hot uh, then you perspire uh, and you you breathe more shallowly and more rapidly. Um, that's the that's the the body's reflex as to how to cool yourself down. Uh, but it only works up to a point. Uh, beyond that point, you've got to do something. You know, like mm. get out the kitchen. You know, it's too hot in here. Mm. Um, uh, and that's that, that's voluntary behavior. So I've contrasted those two things. I'm saying that when you just when your body's just perspiring, that's not a drive. It's just a reflex. Uh, yes, 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 yes. The yes. drive is the feeling. I'm too hot. The feeling, please note, is what motivates you. It's the it's a felt unpleasantness. Sure. Um, which yeah. But but sorry, when I said I've oversimplified it, I just want to insert this bit in George that between those two poles, there's a, a, an intermediate space, which is once we've learned things from experience, and if they are uh, reliably successful. Uh, then we automatize those things too. So we have learnt automatisms um, that, that, that they call non-declarative memories. Remember what I said, memory is just prediction. So we have in the non the, the unconscious memory systems of the brain, um, the, the, the subcortical ones, the ones in the basal ganglia and the amygdala and cerebellum and so on, these subcortical non-declarative uh, uh, unconscious memory systems are memory systems. In other words, they are learnt predictions, but they have proven themselves to be so um, reliable that they become automatized too. So we have reflexes and instincts, uh, which is the inbuilt predictions. Uh, then we have the automatized, uh, what we call non-declarative uh, predictions. And then they're the ones that are up for grabs that we're not so sure about. Uh, and those we call declarative. Those are the cortical memory systems. And those are, are are always conscious. So when there's a demand, it means that the reflex hasn't worked, and the learnt, uh, 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 the overlearnt, the sort of stereotyped, uh, routinized procedures and habits. Uh, when those when those uh, fail us, then we have uh, we have to um, have uh, the conscious uh, thinking and feeling our way through the problem again. That's what we call working memory. That's short-term memory that's something being in consciousness and it's a crucial crucial thing uh, the, the the this the the fact that consciousness attaches to where the uncertainty is tells us a hell of a lot about what consciousness is for uh, what work consciousness is doing and i'll tell you the nub of it is in my view that uh, remember when i said that if if what you're doing is not working then you have the, you're deviating 
uh, away from homeostasis, that feels bad. Uh, if what you're doing is working, then you're heading back towards homeostasis, that feels good. And it's that feeling function. Uh, it's, it's what underwrites choice. Voluntary yes. behavior uh, is mediated by feeling. Uh, yes. it, there has to be some value system uh, that determines choices. Otherwise, choices would be random. There must be something that's better and something that's worse. And that better and worse this uh, is registered in the mind as pleasant feelings and unpleasant feelings. Pleasant feelings uh, mean this is good, this is working. Unpleasant feelings mean this is bad, it's not working. And it's those feeling we feel our way through the problem. Uh, so like if, for example, you're in a carbon dioxide filled room and you can't breathe, uh, you go upstairs and you can't breathe even more. That That's the bad feeling. It means you've made a bad choice. You then go downstairs and you find the relief uh, of being able to uh, uh, breathe down there. And that means you've made the right choice. And so your voluntary actions are guided by feelings. And I think that is the absolute essence of what consciousness is. Consciousness is feeling. Um, yes. And that guides, uh, that guides a, a, a conscious action. In other words, it guides voluntary action. It makes perfect sense. And I have a question, which is um, in terms of this idea of um, with regards to what you've said, can, however, uh, this notion, it's not binary necessarily in the sense of feeling, because feeling is a sort of, I don't know what the uh, graduate, sort of granular kind of, um, it's, um, there's sort of different uh, states of, uh, for example, alexithemia. Um, in alexithemia, people, you know, they report that they are unable to feel certain things, or maybe sometimes they don't really have any feeling or can't describe it. And so therefore, can these drives be happening? And maybe, so, okay, basically, I'll, this will make um, more clear. So there's this, I, pay, I found this paper, you might have read it, it's by someone called Michael Michael, uh, 2020, it's called Unconscious Emotion and Free Energy, a Philosophical and Neuroscientific Exploration. So I'll just quickly read it, so it's a short paragraph, he puts... The focus of the paper, to be more specific, will be on the repression of the consciousness of emotion. I use this cumbersome phrase to hone in on the form of repression at stake. Freud, despite his aforementioned comments, did speak about the repression of emotions, except that what he actually spoke about in this context was chiefly the suppression of affect. He wrote, this is Freud, to suppress the development of affect is the true aim of repression, and its work is incomplete if the aim is not achieved. There, and then that's the end of quote. There is a distinction for Freud between the suppression of affect and the repression of ideas, which is that unconscious ideas continue to exist after repression as actual structures in the unconscious system. Whereas all that corresponds in that system to unconscious affects is a potential beginning, which is prevented from developing. The full suppression of affect cannot co-occur with full emotion since in Freud's account, such suppression prevents the development of the emotion so then he said basically goes on to say um okay he says what i wish to focus on instead and which freud strictly denied as a possibility is the case where the emotion occurs indeed with felt consequences as in the unexplained bodily feelings that on my account hysterics hysterics which i suppose is quite an antiquated word interpret as due to a symptom but where consciousness of this emotion is presented from arising due to repression so then he says lastly in all probability there are many this is a word i was looking for when i was using granularity gradations in the repression of emotion psychological defense against emotion in other words may bring about effects that fluctuate so yeah i suppose that was my question really it's 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 not it's a dynamic thing right and therefore and i suppose um we can say can we say though that emotions can be experienced and therefore and to an extent not felt or at least not almost declared by the person so um, i would like to distinguish between two cases the first is the one that you describe on the basis of what you just read there um and that's the 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 the, the standard freudian view um, I'll, I'll explain it with a very simple example so that so that people can uh, picture it you know rather than talk about it in theoretical abstractions. Uh, yeah. I let us say uh, I feel fear whenever I see spiders. Um, therefore I avoid spiders so that I don't feel fear. 
Um, and the same could be said, uh, it, internal representations, you know, uh, ideas of spiders um, are scary. So I don't have those ideas. I avoid thinking those thoughts. I, I avoid thinking spider thoughts. Now, uh, what Freud is saying is that the idea of the spider is avoided. Um, and in this way, you avoid feeling fear. It's not that you have repressed the fear. You have repressed the spider thought. And in this way, uh, it protects right. you from experiences of fear. So the, 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 uh, when people speak of unconscious affects or unconscious emotions or unconscious feelings, repressed feelings, Freud says that's not really uh, logically correct or, or, or mechanistically correct. You haven't repressed the feeling. You've suppressed the feeling by repressing uh, the, the idea, by not allowing yourself to think, by not going there, uh, you don't have the feeling. Uh, you don't have it at all. The feeling doesn't arise. But it has restricted uh, your range of possible activities in the outside world and in the interior of your mind. You are now excluding the possibility of thinking certain thoughts, which are ne nevertheless representations of part of the world. So you kind of narrow the scope of what you can do in the world. Um, but uh, the benefit of doing that is that you, you, you uh, have fewer unpleasant experiences. So that's the basic Freudian idea. That's why Freud distinguishes uh, between, he says, only ideas can be repressed. Affects can't be repressed. The repressing of ideas is in order to suppress the possibility of a feeling even arising in the first place. It's not an ongoing structure that, that has become unconscious. It's a, an, it's a here and now experience that is not being experienced. That, that's, right, that's his right. Mood. But now there's a there's a second case which rather which makes it a little bit more complicated, and I mentioned this because of what you said about alexithymia. Um, there's also the case where you have feelings, um, but you don't know what those feelings are about. This is a common enough situation. Uh, people say I'm anxious all the time, but I don't know why, or I'm depressed, but there's no reason for it, you know. And uh, so there, what we're talking about is a somewhat and the alexithymic says, you know, I, alexithymia, the word refers to no words for feelings. Uh, and I think that that's an important point. Uh, if, if, if there were people who literally didn't have feelings, they'd be dead. I mean, you know, it's not possible to survive without feelings. Remember, feelings are not only emotional feelings. If feelings include the sorts of things I've been talking about so much in our conversation, things like hunger and sleepiness um, and uh, suffocation alarm mm. uh, and yeah. and the like you know these are feelings in other words they have a valence they have a, a pleasantness and an unpleasantness which is the which is the keynote of what we mean by feeling feelings oh, yeah. are, are good or bad and you feel them um there's uh, if, if you didn't feel anything you wouldn't you wouldn't eat you wouldn't sleep you wouldn't drink you wouldn't avoid um tissue damage you know you would you would you would you wouldn't survive uh, for very long at all um, and the same applies to emotional feelings. It's not only bodily feelings. Fear just means don't get into dangerous situations. You know, separation distress for us mammals is a, you know, important thing. We we when we little mammals can't look after themselves, they have to attach and stay close to their mummies. Uh, rage uh, means it, it's a feeling that arises when there's a frustrating impediment, something getting between you and what you need. If you don't learn how to get rid of things. That prevent you from getting what you need, you know, you, 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 you've had it. So emotions uh, are, are no different from bodily affects. They all work uh, in, in, in the same way. But what the feeling tells you is uh, a certain one of your needs is not being met. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know why your need is not being met. So I, I separate it into two sort of levels. It is the primary level is I feel this it, and, and not in words. It's just I feel it. Uh, and then the second level is I feel this about that. That is an elaboration of your feeling. It's a, a possibility um, of being able to reflect upon the causes of your feeling. Um, the context uh, within which your feeling arises it explains the feeling. And that's conscious cognition. And um so, you know, we're not all of us equally adept uh, at uh, thinking about our feelings 
naming our feelings, recognizing them, uh, associating them uh, with the uh, external, um, both here and now, and also past uh, experiences that caused us to have those feelings. Um, that That is uh, a different story. So I don't believe that uh, it's even possible uh, to not have feelings. I, I really don't think yeah, so. yeah. except for a creature that functions only by reflex. Uh, and uh, there are such creatures. They're very, very simple creatures. Uh, and the, the, the downside for them is that as soon as they find themselves in a situation that their reflexes didn't predict, uh, they die. You know, they just they just do they do the only thing that they know how to do, like a moth uh, flying at a into a flame. You know, it's because the moths have a reflex that where the light is, you go there. And uh, if you if that's all that you uh, are capable of, uh, of of predicting, you know, when there's light head towards it, then a hell of a lot of the time, uh, you know, it's it's going to end in tears. And so the adaptive advantage of feeling is that it enables you to, as I just said earlier, you know, it enables voluntary behavior. It enables you to make choices. If your reflex of uh, instinctual behavior doesn't work, then you can try something else. That's what feeling is for. That's what consciousness is for. Yes. And this naturally um, now brings us on to consciousness, which is, um, yeah, when I first thought about talking to you, it was predominantly I had sort of psychoanalysis and neuropsychoanalysis in my mind, which is kind of strange because like many people um, such as yourself, um, I'm fascinated by consciousness, what consciousness is, um, and I've found myself lost in different uh, attempts to explain it, um, you know, uh and there's so many places I could go, you know, whether it was, do we start with Kant? I don't know. But no, I suppose. So to start with, you express yourself uh, as a dual aspect monist, which I believe that's right. Yeah. Mm. Um, which is something I to me is most intuitively um, feels. And it's, I saw it's the only way I can I can't say it's rational. Well, maybe there is it. Maybe logically it does make most sense, but at least it feels to me to make the most sense what how would you describe to somebody um what dual who hasn't heard of dual aspect monism what, how would you describe that well um like with my example of fear of spiders to try and illustrate what repression is uh, and isn't uh, let me use a very practical um uh, illustration uh, of dual aspect monism uh, i wake up in the morning my eyes are closed but I've woken up, so I'm conscious, and I experience myself as existing, and I think I'm Mark Solms. Uh, thank God for that. I'm, I'm here still. You know, yeah. That's my mind. There's no other word for that. That's the mental, subjective being of Mark Solms. I then get out of bed, and I stagger over to the bathroom, and I look at the mirror, and I see this body in the mirror uh, staring back at me, uh, that is the body of Mark Solms. And so I say, ah, oh, that's Mark Solms. You know, further evidence that, that he's still with us. You know? um, the, the, that is quite a different thing, the, 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 the physical object uh, that is reflected in the mirror is quite a different thing from the subjective experience of, <clears throat> of, of waking up in the morning with your eyes closed. That's your mind, that's your body. Now, both of them are called Mark Solms. Um, and there's the, the, there's the rub. Um, are there two Mark Solmses, you know, or is there only one? So the dual aspect monists, the monism in dual aspect monism is to say there's only one Mark Solms. Um, the dual aspect uh, part of the story is, but evidently he, uh, he appears in two different forms, uh, either as a subjective being of Mark Solms or as an objective body of Mark Solms, these are two different ways of uh, perceiving one and the same thing. Yeah. Uh, that's all that it boils down to, that uh, there's one thing called Mark Solms, and you can register him in two different ways. If you are Mark Solms, you can have the subjective uh, feeling of being Mark Solms, uh, and you can also have the objective uh, 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 
perception of Mark Solves as a as an object, as a body. They are the dual aspects, the two different ways in which you can represent or 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 experience or observe um, this this single underlying entity called Mark Solves. Right, which is. And then the question to me is, okay, there, we've got the aspects. So what is this sort of uh, substratum, this, this the, the, the monism almost, you know, um, the, or what Kant might call, or Schopenhauer, the, maybe more Kant, the, the, num the noumena. Um, and from my own, so from reading your, um, The Hidden Spring, um, and, you know, with your uh, account of free energy and... For, uh, Correct me if I'm uh, wrong or elaborate. For my understanding um, of your understanding on consciousness, or rather as to what this monism might be, is some sort of information processing. That's the best that we can, I don't know, give, because ultimately uh, I'm assuming you don't, well, maybe you do believe that we can access it, but by virtue in a way of it being the sort of noumena, we can't access it, that we only have the aspects, right? This, yeah. Yeah, so let me start by uh, pointing out, uh, unlike you and me, uh, who think that's a kind of commonsensical way of thinking about a dual aspect monism, uh, most scientists, neuroscientists, um, are not dual aspect monists. They are, they are materialist, materialist monists. Uh, they, that, that is to say, they, they don't believe that the mind and the body are two different ways of perceiving the same thing. They think the mind is in fact a product of the body. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's an emergent property of the body, which can actually be reduced ultimately to the material processes in the body. So the mind is a kind of a, a, a function or a excrescence or a emergent property uh, of the body, but the body is the real stuff. Uh, that's their monism. So that's materialist monism. I don't hold that view. And this is where it starts to sound less intuitive to many people. I do not believe that conscious states are produced by brain cells in, in, in the way that the liver produces bile. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I think that there's two different ways of looking at the same thing. Uh, the, the, the rough and ready example, I say rough and ready because it's you know, technically it's quite complicated, but it's the rough and ready uh, an easy to understand example is that if you listen uh, to lightning with your ear, you hear thunder. Uh, if you look at lightning with your eye, uh, you see uh, a, a bolt uh, of lightning. These are two different manifestations of this singular underlying process, which uh, is a which is a, a, a gradient of of, of the, the electrons. You know the potential difference in the the, the the, the, the geophysical space. That, so we have a theory, uh, an abstraction called electricity, um, and uh, we can observe it with our eyes as lightning, and we can listen to, listen to it with our ears you know, as thunder. Uh, that doesn't mean that the lightning causes the thunder, uh, that, this, that the visual uh, type of lightning causes the auditory type of thunder. Uh, it, it, to me, it makes no sense to say that you know, that one sense modality causes another sense modality to register the same thing. It's two different sense modalities registering one and the same underlying thing. And, and the, the, the crucial point there is, as I say, electricity is an abstraction, just as Mark Solms is an abstraction, uh, just as, um, uh, say, the function of memory, which we were talking about earlier, it's an abstraction. So you can have a memory that is a subjective experience of recalling an event to mind, uh, or you can look uh, at the brain uh, at the using optogenetics, for example, you can actually see you know, the, the memory trace lighting up in these neurons. And those are two different ways of experiencing the same thing called memory. You know, the, so we want to, if you want to understand um, this thing called memory, uh, you use both sets of data. You say, well, you know, you can only hold uh, uh, short-term memory if there's a limited capacity. Um, 
uh, 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 you experience that. I can't, I can't recite an, an endless string of numbers. I can only recite about seven numbers. And after that, it starts to become difficult. That's an experience of the limits and constraints of my memory. Uh, you can look at the brain and you can see uh, the, 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 the business of neurotransmitted depletion at the synapse that it, it's necessarily, you know, the short-term memory has a limit because of its physiological, the, the physiological processes underpinning uh, the, the, uh, the, the holding of uh, the, 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 the reverberating trace that is the short-term memory in, 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 in um, physiological terms. And then you say, well, this experience and this thing that I'm seeing must be reducible to one set of laws. And those, those are actually what I've just told you about is reducible to a thing called Miller's Law. Uh, and uh, yes. so we're looking for abstract mechanisms that explain both sets of phenomena. That's the, that's the best way to sort of um, enter into the, the, the further point that you made uh, about information processing. Because uh, the, 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 let me just be clear about this. If physiological manifestations, physiological phenomena, and psychological manifestations, psychological phenomena, are just uh, ways of observing some underlying um, uh, functional organization or mechanism, then we must have a language for that mechanism, which is neither physiological nor psychological, it has to be sort of deeper than both of them. It's, it's, it, it's, uh, and so we're looking for a language which is the language of inference from observation. So we have phenomena and phenomena, and then we want to get to what is the thing that explains them both, that causes them both. That's the mechanism. And we need a neutral language, uh, a language uh, that transcends and underpins uh, both uh, the physiology of the brain and the psychology of the mind. And uh, it seems to me, for all sorts of reasons, which we can go into if you like, that the abstract uh, language of information processing, information processing is not an experience. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a, a physiological process. It's the mechanism that explains what the physiology of nerve cells uh, is, uh, is doing. Uh, and it's also a mechanism which explains what the experience in consciousness uh, is, is all about. And it's one singular mechanism. So I think that the language of, of information processing, which is ultimately derived from statistical mechanics, you know, it's an entirely abstract language, but it seems the most apt language for um, a unified science of the mind and the brain, which is what we have to um, come to, uh, what we have to uh, uh, establish if we are if we are to have a dual aspect monist uh, neuropsychology. Yes, and I think that makes perfect sense, and I completely agree. And you know, if to have an account, yeah, we need to have that sort of unifying language. The, the it, there's another uh, question, or it the other aspect of consciousness, right? is almost the predictability of it can we predict and um, not only can we predict consciousness but and this is something i think yeah you touch on in your book and it's something you this idea of almost in silico you know um or can consciousness so i wrote let me explain it or, or let me ask this question i um actually wrote down so given that matter and minor aspects how can we expect an aspect to give rise to another that is, by arranging matter in a particular way, how can we expect it to give rise to consciousness? Unless are we thinking that in, in doing that, we are hacking almost the substrate of whatever underlies them both. Um, so uh, does that make sense as to what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me um, come at it like this. Um, a, a crucial aspect of uh, the information processing approach is that uh, it is substrate independent. Uh, you, can, you can process uh, information um, using an algorithm. Uh, that algorithm uh, can either be uh, executed by the hardware uh, of a computer, uh, or it can be executed by the hardware of a brain. 
if it's the same algorithm, it's doing the same, performing the same process, uh, then the information processing is the same, regardless of which substrate uh, it, it um, unfolds over. That's right. what I mean by abstract mechanism. You know, it's the it's not the concrete um, uh, uh, vehicle. Uh, it is what are the laws that explain the behavior of that vehicle? Why? What? What is the underlying causal principles which which um, result in this observable behavior? So information processing uh, is substrate independent. And now let me illustrate that by an example. In fact, um, David Chalmers uses this example that you have a brain, imagine, and in fact, you don't have to imagine this because there are such things, but imagine we have artificial neurons, it's, it's silicon neurons, to use the term that you used a moment ago. Um, in other words, you have little, little uh, information processing devices uh, which perform the same function as an individual neuron. Um, now you remove one neuron from your brain and you replace it with a silicon neuron that does the same thing. Um, and then you do it with another one, and then with another one, and then with another one. Uh, Thomas's point is slowly as you as you as you replace all the biological neurons with artificial ones, uh, you have the, the, the actual mechanism at work remains the same. And so you by by duplicating or replicating the exact uh, functional architecture, uh, of a biological brain uh, with a the, the, the same functional architecture in, in a artificial brain, uh, you will uh, have an, an artificial brain that performs the same, does the same stuff uh, as a biological brain. And uh, you know, it, 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 so that's the basic idea that it's substrate independent. It's, it, if it's performing the same functions, it's doing the same things because it's organized in the same way. It has the same causal processes underpinning it. It doesn't matter what the substance is that is performing those processes. That's that's the basic idea um, that you're alluding to because uh, I gather implicit in what you're saying is the question, can we engineer um, a an, an artificial consciousness? If we understand what the uh, information processing uh, mechanisms are uh, which law which are the lawful uh, 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 the, 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 under, the the things which actually cause conscious phenomena um, in terms of the underlying monist abstract language that these mechanisms are causing these physiological phenomena and these conscious phenomena then if we produce uh, in silico uh, the same mechanism, it should produce the same functions, and then we should be able to produce uh, a conscious machine. That's that's the basic idea. Um, that uh, this sort of rather shocking idea that flows from uh, the belief uh, that the information processing is substrate independent. Uh, you know, just, just to just to illustrate it in a nice, simple way again, just because I think what I just said might sound a little bit spooky uh, i'm saying just something like you know we uh, with our eyes uh, and optic nerves and lateral geniculate body and posterior uh, occipital cortex we can see and recognize things and commit visual experiences to memory yeah, but so can your phone you know your mobile phone uh, has a camera which registers light waves transduces them into electrical signals uh, and uh, then uh, recognizes that's a face. I mean, most of our phones these days recognize when we're looking at a face. Uh, you know, if you're trying to take a photograph with your phone, it's it recognizes this is a face. And then you click the button, and then it commits that face to memory. So functions like perception uh, and memory can be performed by simple devices. You know, like like mobile phones. Um, and uh, the, the the argument here is if if consciousness is just a, a function also of information processing, like perception and memory are, uh, as I've just illustrated they are, uh, then why shouldn't the same apply to consciousness? Or is consciousness something uh, which somehow transcends uh, the laws of nature and exists in some parallel universe? I mean, that's what we're up against. Because if what I'm saying is not possible, 
then it has very weird implications uh, for for consciousness. It means consciousness exists out of uh, in, in some, some somewhere outside of the natural order of things. You know, it's, there's so many questions going through my, you know, names going through my mind. Um, you know, of people whose work sort of bears upon this, like Donald Hoffman and things. But and, and slightly deviate. But I suppose with what you're saying um, in terms of you know, can we say with an, um, a silicon neuron are we in that in doing that though we are assuming that matter is sufficient it's almost as though we're explaining consciousness in terms of another aspect does that um well i don't think it's an aspect uh, the aspect, I mean, the, the word aspect as used in metaphysics uh, of dual aspect monism, yeah. the aspects are the observational uh, phenomena, the observable phenomena of right. aspects. Right. Um, the, 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 so dual aspects means two ways of perceiving. Monism means one underlying thing. The crucial bit you mentioned Kant earlier, the crucial thing about that underlying thing is it is not directly observable. Right, it is, right. It is inferred from the observations. And uh, so that's what we are talking about. Um, so so you... it's not an aspect. It's the thing we infer from the aspects to be what underlies and causes and explains the phenomenology on these two aspects. So it is the underlying reality itself. Now, in case it sounds... Um, arbitrary uh, let me just remind anybody who's listening to or, or watching this uh, that there is a, a very respectable school of thought in contemporary physics uh, which says what i've just said um, that uh, 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 actually I mean, quantum physics is all about probabilities it's all it's all about it, it, you know there's that famous saying about quantum physics when people say but i can't understand it it doesn't make sense that the answer is shut up and calculate you know it does it doesn't matter if you can't understand it the, the the equations you know always work therefore they explain it and the equations are the truth even if you can't get it that's how it works because look you run that equation that always produces the result that was predicted and and vice versa from the phenomena you can always infer the same equations and um, so the underlying the way that um, we uh, understand um, the, all of these weird and wonderful phenomena that we observe uh, uh, at the quantum level in physics, uh, uh, which is the fundamental level of everything. It's not like there's a, that there's a quantum physics and a, 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 that, that doesn't apply um, to the macro scale. It is just that you know, we don't need to go to that level of complexity and detail at the macro scale. We can just look at the averages. But fundamentally, the universe uh, is a quantum universe. In other words, our best explanation um, of, of everything that we, ex that we perceive, all of the phenomena, all of the observable phenomena, uh, we don't reduce it anymore in physics to matter. Matter is not a fundamental property uh, mm. uh, uh, anymore in physics. Uh, we reduce it to be way beyond matter you know, to these abstractions. Uh, which is what the, the laws of quantum physics are. And uh, there's a, there are, uh, I mean, like a very well-known physicist, because he writes uh, uh, for the general public, Carlo Rovelli. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. it's, he's a, he's a, a representative of this um, tradition that I was saying is very respectable. It starts with a physicist named John Wheeler. Uh, but it's, it, it's, uh, so it's a, it's a information, uh, it, uh, or, or, or relational interpretation of quantum physics, uh, which is basically John Wheeler's famous statement, it from bit, he's saying the phenomena, all phenomena, all observable things, that's the it, all, all its, all observable things are ultimately uh, explicable in, in terms of bits, in other words, in terms of information. It's all, it's all a probabilistic information processing uh, 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 fundamental ontology of the universe is these abstract rules that 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 uh, are informational and uh, and our engagement with it produces these observable phenomena 
So this is not an arbitrary view, just sort of conjured up to try to get us out of the uncomfortable uh, corner of, uh, of, of dualism, of the fact that the, the, the gap between the body and the mind. I think that it's not only uh, the fundamental reality of both body and mind is informational. There's a very respectable view in physics that the fundamental reality of the whole bloody universe is informational. Um, so watch that space. Yeah, interesting. So, dare I ask, if you had to, if you were a betting man, do you believe, do you think there is reason to believe that consciousness can be generated, engineered? Or would you oh, not well, like, or do you think it's too, it, it's too early to make any comments? No, I don't think it's too early. I think that uh, I think that we are living, you and me, right now, uh, through the few years uh, during which consciousness is going is being engineered. Um, but let me just make sure that people understand what I mean by consciousness. Um, I I have said uh, is, is some time back in this conversation that the fundamental. A form of consciousness that, uh, and function of consciousness is to feel that feelings are the, the the most elementary basic form of consciousness then feelings get applied to cognitions i feel like this about that so affect raw feeling is the most most basic kind of consciousness and it then gets elaborated into these into these complex uh, cognitive forms and perceptual forms that so dominate our human consciousness with all of our vast cortical uh, uh, processing. Um, but the dawn of consciousness in evolution uh, would not have been philosophical uh, conversations like this. Uh, it would have been a, a creature just registering, I'm too hot, uh, not in words, just the feeling, and then doing something about it, you know, uh, the, the, the enormous uh, adaptive advantage I spoke of earlier, of being able to feel your own state, it enables you to make choices uh, and therefore to transcend um, the, 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 the stereotype confines of, of reflex. And um, so when I speak of consciousness, um, I, I, I mean just anything that it is like to feel. To the, so the, if, the, if the, the, the system feels its own state. Uh, I'm running out of electricity supplies, you know, for example, um, if, I'm a, if I'm a computer, um, they're just being aware, my, uh, my energy supplies are running low and that's bad for my survival. I'm going to cease to exist uh, unless, I, unless I replenish my energy supplies. That's the sort of feeling I'm talking about. That, that's what I mean by consciousness because I believe that it's just common sense if you're going to engineer consciousness, you should start by engineering its simplest form. And that is just raw feelings. Raw feelings are just, uh, we spoke earlier about homeostasis. Any self-organizing system, a system which is, which, which is designed to behave in such a way as to continue to exist. In other words, it must do whatever it does, uh, has to uh, have the outcome that it continues to exist as a system. That is a homeostatic system. Um, and so I believe that we can describe the mechanism of feeling uh, quite uh, simply. It is, if you have a self-organizing system, in other words, a system which is trying to continue to exist, um, then it has to register its own needs. In other words, deviations from its viable states. Um, and those have to be uh, uh, have a valence. In other words, it's good or it's bad. It's bad for my survival or it's good for my survival. So there you have the basics. There's a subjective registering my own state in terms of goodness and badness across a number of parameters. So they're categorical variables. They're qualitatively distinct. Energy supplies versus uh, tissue damage versus um, needing to, uh, cool, to, to keep the temperature of the thing down. And so all the things which which, which make it viable, uh, any self-organizing system that has those mechanisms, uh, I, I think from the point of view of the system, you're talking about feelings. That's what feelings are. So there's no great mystery there. 
I, I think that the only thing that's needed, the, the leap that's needed, is to allow yourself to take the point of view of the system. Because if you don't take the point of view of the system, you've excluded subjectivity, which is, remember, about the dual aspect. The subjective aspect, the being of the system, is where the mental states are registered, the con conscious states, the feeling states. So you said, um, am I a bet? If I were a betting man, what would I bet? Uh, there are projects. Go I'm involved in one such project myself. Yes, uh, yes. Projects right now uh, where um, teams of computer scientists and physicists and and um, and uh, uh, neuroscientists are working together to to try to engineer uh, such such a system and. Uh, then, of course, uh, once that's uh, possible, to register, to, to engineer a system which registers subjectively uh, it, it, the goodness and badness of what it's doing for itself uh, in terms of its uh, basic value system, which is to continue to exist and register that across a range of different qualitatively distinctive parameters, then you have a, a feeling, uh, an, an, an artificial uh, a, a machine that feels. Then you can elaborate that and use that functionality because don't forget what that functionality is for. As I said, it's really fantastically valuable um, adaptation. Uh, you can then use that functionality and apply it to much more complex forms of cognition. And uh, you know, then you would have uh, something closer to what I think most people have in mind when they speak of an artificial consciousness. This chat GPT and this sort of stuff, the Lambda, you know, uh, 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 a, a thing that has been talked about so much, I think is starting at the wrong end. You know, you don't start with language models um, in order to engineer consciousness. You've got to start with, there's a wonderful phrase that Daniel Dennett uses. He says, the computer has to give a damn. <laughs> you have to start with a system that actually gives a damn uh, uh, in order for uh, it yeah. to be a feeling system. And then all of this other stuff, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, language uh, 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 and the like uh, can, can be added. But you can't start with the language without feeling. It won't be conscious. I suppose my question that, that comes to my mind is, could uh, when you say so affect is the most basic element, uh, it's the most sort of rudimentary form of consciousness, and that it's underpinned by some sort of information processing, or at least, you know, the, in this monist sense. <clears throat> it, I suppose, so we just, I suppose, yeah, therefore it's a given almost. It's just consciousness just is. It's just a, it's just a natural uh, aspect of life. But what I can't help but wonder is, say when you're trying to create or engineer a system that um, is, gives a damn about itself, could it not all of this go on in the dark, so to speak, quantitatively, whereby it just registers, you know, this value is greater than this value? This value, does that make sense? Yeah. Now, so that's Chalmers's view, you know, that um, why can't all of this information processing just go on in the dark? He's saying that there's some magical extra thing that has to be added uh, before it has qualia. So, so let me be very clear. Uh, I'm saying the following. If you have a system, uh, which a self-organizing system, uh, which, which, which means a system that everything that it does um, is done in order to continue to exist, that, 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 that system already gives it that mechanistically. It has, it has a value system, which is it's good to exist, it's bad not to exist. That's the basic design principle of such a system, among which, by the way, we should count ourselves. Uh, because we are self-organizing systems, everything that we do uh, as, a, as, a, as a species, uh, uh, the, the design of our phenotype over natural selection is the, those things which work in terms of uh, us, uh, us surviving as a species uh, is what underpins in what form we take. So if you have a self-organizing system, which therefore by definition gives a damn, there's a goodness and a badness, from its own point of view, because it's only from its own point of view that things are good or bad. It's not, I don't give a damn about that system. You know, 
but if you're the system, you do give a damn because your basic design principle is I must survive. Uh, I must do whatever is necessary to continue to exist. So if you have such a system and then you give it categorical needs, in other words, something akin to hunger versus thirst versus sleepiness, uh, needs which can't just be averaged. You have to meet each one of them in its own right. You can't just say, I'm going to sleep a lot, and then I'm meeting, on average, a, a lot of need. You've got to know you have to sleep and eat and drink. If you have a system that functions like that, I have to replenish energy supplies, and I must not overheat, uh, and I must not bang into things. Um, then you have categorical variables. The crucial thing about categorical variables is they are distinguished qualitatively. That's the meaning of a categorical variable. It's, yes, it's a yes. category which is qualitatively distinctive. You can't reduce it to a common denominator. If you have a system like that, then it, it, it is a system which has needs. That's what they are. You can, you can call them whatever you like, but the meaning of the word need is that the system needs to do something in order to carry from its own point of view these things matter in terms of its basic design principle which is to continue existing and those needs are qualitatively distinctive and subjectively registered then you've described qualia mechanistically that's what qualia are the only thing that stops you from seeing that is that you're 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 not willing to take the viewpoint of being such a system and I'm saying, uh, if you were such a system, if you have that functionality, you would have feelings. Feelings simply are subjectively registered, qualitatively distinctive, valenced needs. Uh, that's what they are. So it's pure prejudice for us to say that such a thing can go on in the dark. It can't, uh, because th that, because you know th that's if you have such a thing, it is a feeling thing, and therefore. Uh, it's not going on in the dark. It's, and you can put it in more, I mean, I know we're out of time, but let me just mm. say that you can put it in much more detail in terms of, you know, uh, what what the consciousness is doing, what the feeling is doing. It's it's re it's the, the, the particular uh, variable that matters, the particular quantity that matters is statistical confidence. The confidence that the system has in its current policy is what I'm doing uh, likely to end in uh, my demise, or is it likely to end in my survival? The palpating of that confidence, which is also known technically as uncertainty, uh, it's the it's the modulation of uncertainty. That is the fundamental of uncertainty in the policy designed to maintain my own survival. That is the precise uh, physical mechanism, physical in the sense of physics, of statistical physics. Uh, that is the precise mechanism that we're talking about. It has the same functionality as consciousness. It is, it is palpating uncertainty. Um, mm. I, I think consciousness is subjective uncertainty, felt uncertainty. I think that's what it actually is. And if you have an apparatus that has that functionality, that apparatus has feelings. Uh, and it's just our prejudice uh, that doesn't allow us uh, to uh, entertain uh, or to recognize uh, that that uh, fact. Yeah, amazing. Um, <laughs> I just think it, I'm just thinking it would be great. It maybe in ten years' time, if I send you another email and we can see where uh, where consciousness is at um, with you know that those enterprises that you speak of. Um, but yeah, as you say, we should um, yeah wrap it up. But um, I mean. Yeah, it's uh, I could speak on this stuff for hours. And, you know, as you said in, um, I think, again, that podcast with Michael Egnor, yeah, I hope I'm getting his name right. Um, you know, it's what matters more, um, you know, um, the, the, these deep questions. Um, and I suppose that's what drew me to you and uh, why it's always so great to talk with people such as yourself, because... You know, since a child, like you talked about as a child, you know, you were compelled and drawn to these ideas of like, what is the mind and the relationship with the brain? And yeah, similarly, you know, it's something I've always, um, it's the thinking which gives me most uh, reward, you know, and um, it's been really, really good talking to you, Mark. And um, I've uh, learned a lot um, 
which I didn't I say I didn't think would happen. I mean, I suppose having read a lot of your work, I felt I was familiar with it, but your explanations of it have clarified things for me. Um, and mm. I think, and I hope people, and I think people will get a lot from it. Um, but to be honest, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, that's <laughs> why I, why I wanted to speak with you. Um, Good. Yeah. So. Good meeting you, George. And thanks very much for your interest and, and uh, for taking the time. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. Great stuff. All right then, Mark. Well, okay. Cheers. Uh, yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.